Okay, let's now have our 12th lecture in Bio 120. We're going to be looking at the carbon cycle and how microbial cells acquire carbon. One of the things about the carbon is the fact that microbial cells are going to play a very important role in carbon fixation. They're going to bring carbon in by either photosynthesis or by chemosynthesis. When we also look at carbon in the environment, microbes are going to be very important in recycling organic carbon by decomposition. So we're going to see that carbon is going to be present in the majority of the environments of the cell and that we're going to have the microorganisms being able to decompose carbon from organic matter and release uh, carbon in the environment as CO2 and also bring that CO2 back into the biological system. When we look at carbon in the earth, we can find it in small biomolecule molecules. Those are going to be your substrates, your intermediate cells, and cell waste. You also find it in complex biomolecules, such as polymers of DNA, protein, and carbohydrates. You also, of course, have carbon in a geological form, as coal, gas, oil, or methane hydrates. Also, to our detriment, in a sense, I believe that we also have carbon in man-made forms, such as plastics, pesticides, herbicides, drugs, and other synthetic compounds. So the, ma the major carbon reservoirs on the planet are going to be rock and sediment. The biological, either terrestrial or aquatic amount of carbon, it's going to be very, very small. So what we're going to see is that when you look at carbon in the environment, you can find a lot of that carbon in the soil layer. Here we have an example from figure 1911, that is looking at the area where carbon is present in the soil. And you can see that you can divide the soil into four regions. The O horizon, which is a layer of undecomposed plant matter, basically the plant matter that is alive. The A horizon, which is below that area. And that is going to be the surface soil, what we call the top soil. It's high in organic matter, dark in color, and we use it oftentimes uh, in agriculture when we till it. This is a place where you're going to find a large number of microorganisms. Lower than this, you have the B horizon, which is a subsoil full of minerals, hummus, and other compounds. Here you have little amount of microbial activity. And at the end, in the bottom area, you're going to have the C horizon, and that is your soil base. And that is going to have the bedrock. And microbial activity is often really low in this environment. So now when we look at our microbes that are present in soil, we can find them around communities. You're going to have microcolonies. Those microcolonies are going to be part of small bacterial communities that are going to be present with sand, with small pockets of air, some areas of water, clay present. And in these communities, you can have many different microcolonies of different organisms. Now, when you look at the diversity of microbes that are present in the soil, you find microorganisms of many different phyla. You find proteobacteria of the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta regions. Also some of the esculents. You can actually see them over here by different species in this um, pie chart. You can find the, the gram-positive acidobacteria. You can find uh, some firmicutes. You can find, uh, sorry, the Tenobacteria are the gram positive. Acidobacteria are not, so I correct myself. You can have bacteroides, a lot of them present. So the majority that you can see also are going to fall in unclassified of minor or minor bacterial groups that we know by um, by their 16s RNA, but we have been able to culture. So what is the fate of organic carbon on the planet? And in a generalization, for every naturally occurring compound, we're going to have a microbe that in one way or another is going to be able to use it, either as an energy source or as a carbon source. And all that is always going to be recycled back as CO2. Now, when you look at the organic matter that is found in soil particles, you're going to have dead, dying, or decaying plant or animal tissue. You're going to have animal droppings. You're going to have insects, worms, microorganisms. And all of that major biomass is going to be polymeric. You're going to have polymers of polysaccharides, proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and lignins. And lignins are complex compounds that are usually derived from wood and are integral part of the cell wall. 
You also are going to find oils and waxes, which are usually a lot of times either from animal origin or from plant origin. So the small macromolecules, the small micromolecules that we're talking about are only about 5% of the total cell mass. Usually we find it in polymeric molecules. And as you know, since microorganisms cannot chew, eat, absorb, or engulf, they have to look at other ways to consume materials from living or dead organisms and food particles that they're present. So what microbes are going to do, and this is what we're going to look at today, are to release exoenzymes that are secreted into the environment. And those exoenzymes, once they're secreted from the microorganism, are going to attack the polymer and break that polymer into monomers. So these exoenzymes, they're going to break the substrates as um, in a process of hydrolysis. And for example, cellulase, the enzyme cellulase, is able to attack cellulose and break the beta-1 to 4 linkage that is present in cellulose by hydrolyzing this particular bond. So how are these exoenzymes released to our environment from microorganisms is the next part that I want to cover. And we're going to look that microorganisms are going to use a secretory system called SEC. And SEC is found in many of the domains of life and is helping to translocate or also integrate proteins across the plasma membrane. Now, the proteins are going to be synthesizing microorganisms in the cytoplasm by ribosomes and form what is called a preprotein. That preprotein is going to have a signal peptide, just like we discussed in Bio 110. Now, during synthesis of those proteins, a protein called SecB is going to bind that nascent signal peptide and stabilize the protein, and it's going to work as a chaperone and bring it closer to other molecules. Now, SecB is now going to bring the nascent protein to SecA, and SecA is able to now work as a motor that is going to use ATP hydrolysis to help translocate the preprotein across a channel. That channel is going to be made from seg Y, E, and G. So the protein will be first captured by seg B using the signal peptide. It's going to be brought to seg A, which is going to use ATP hydrolysis to translocate the protein through a channel form of seg Y, E, and G proteins. Now, once translocated, as you may imagine, into the periplasm, those proteins signal peptidase signal peptides, excuse me, are going to be removed by the enzyme signal peptidase. And at the end, in the periplasm, all the information required for that protein to acquire its configuration is going to be encoded in the primary sequence and therefore the protein will fold nicely to the proper shape once it is outside of the cell in the periplasm. Now, the question is how do gram-negative bacteria are able then to transport those proteins from the periplasmic region into the extracellular region? And that is going to be the next section that I'm going to touch upon. And we're going to be looking at the fact that bacteria contain what is called um, protein secretory systems. And those can be divided into type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, and type 5. Now, these proteins are going to either be sec dependent or sec independent, and they're going to be able then to help the microorganism bring some of those proteins that are going to be made in the cytoplasm and help export them out into the extracellular milieu outside of the periplasm. So this image over here has a more detailed um, image showing you the different kinds of secretory proteins that I just mentioned, divided by how they use SEC. And what we're going to see is that they're going to have SEC-dependent proteins and SEC-independent proteins. The SEC-dependent proteins are going to be the type 2 and type 5 secretion systems. What you can appreciate from the image, the polypeptides made in the cytoplasm are going to be pumped outside by the SEC proteins, and then in the type 5 system, you're going to have another channel that is going to be able to export the protein outside of the cell. Now, the type 2 secretion system is going to also take advantage of SEC to bring the protein into the periplasm 
and from the periplasm is going to be able to export it already folded to the outside, and that is going to require ATP. Now, the three systems that are SEC independent are going to be the type 1, type 3, and type 4. All of these are going to require ATP for energy to bring the proteins directly from the cytoplasm to the external region. Interestingly, the one that I would like you to bring your attention to is going to be the type 1 secretion system, which we already have learned about it, and that is the ABC transporter. Now, the other secretory pathway that I want to show you is the type 3 secretion system. That is going to be the injectosome, and that is it's related to the flagellum, and it works by connecting itself to another cell through the needle-like protrusion that is outside of the outer membrane. Therefore, the bacteria is able to secrete proteins from its cytoplasm through the type 3 secretion system, through the needle, and into the cytoplasm of a target cell. Now, what I'm doing over here from this figure is that I'm including the text from this particular review of Nature Reviews of Microbiology, and this text is fine over here. And I'm not going to go and read it in detail for you, but I want to show you that they are all of them present. So you have the type 1 secretion system, or we call it T1SS. You have the type 2 secretion system, or the T2SS. You also have the type 3 secretion system, or T3SS, and the type 4 secretion system. Also, type 5 secretion system, and one that is not shown in the image is the type 6 secretion system. So I am leaving this information for you here so you can use it as part of your uh, reading because I don't want to give you the entire article. I just want you to concentrate into this type secretion systems. Now, the enzymes that are going to help the microorganism to hydrolyze polymers are going to be made inside the cytoplasm and through one of the secretion systems are going to be transported to the outside of the cell. In the outside, these enzymes are going to be able to hydrolyze their reactions against their targets. For example, you have carbohydrates, you're going to have cellulose, xylan, starch, glycogen, which is the um, animal starch, pectin, and chitin. Those are going to be degraded by enzymes such as cellulases or gluconases for cellulose, silanases for silan, amylases for starch, glycogen also can be digested by an amylase, chitinases can degrade chitin, and pectinolytic enzymes can degrade pectin. You also are going to find nucleic acids, RNA and DNA. So RNases and DNases will help you hydrolyze those polymers into their monomers. And proteins can be the target of proteinases and peptidases. Last, lipids can be broken down by lipases, and therefore the components of the lipids are going to then be able to be used for energy or carbon for the cell. This particular table here shows you the different kinds of polysaccharides that are present in some of the uh, organic molecules, so, and is divided by groups. So you have murine and dextrin found in bacteria, you have all the plant polymers and all the animal polymers. It's also showing you the kind of monomer that is um, making that polymer. And if you have a secondary kind of monosaccharide, also add it. For example, you have murine, uh, in murine, which is a different word for peptidoglycan, you have an acetyl glutamic acid and an acetyl muramic uh, acid. So all of them um, are going to be present there. And it's showing you the linkages that the uh, monomers are present. So if there's a linkage, like the beta-1,4 is shown over there, and if the polymer branches, it's also shown there. So what I want you to take a look is at the different kind of um, polysaccharides that are present and how they may be diluted just may be digested by a hydrolyzing enzyme. So the hydrolysis of these polymers are go is going to happen during the degradation. You're going to have a hydrolytic attack that is going to break the bonds joining the monomers, and that is going to uh, use a water molecule. The energy that is being released from that bond is not conserved and therefore it will be lost as heat. That is the reason, for example, why your compost heap is always warm, because the release 
the bonds that are being broken uh, as the compost is being degraded, it's the energy from the spawn is released as heat to the environment. So here you have your bacterium, here you have a polymer, and as you can appreciate, the enzymes have been released. So now that microorganism, the enzymes that are hydrolyzing that polymer are going to break that polymer into monomers. And now those monomers are going to be brought inside the cell through the mechanisms that we already addressed in class about transport. So those monomers are now be, are going to be able to be utilized into catabolic reactions to generate energy or anabolic reactions to make molecules for the cell. So a molecule is going to be uptaken, as you know, it's going to you should most likely use active transport, especially if the concentration gradient is greater inside the cell, and you're going to require energy for that. So when the molecule is brought inside, those molecules are going to be degraded and that energy can then be harvested for the cell's benefit. So when we look at this, we're going to see that proteins will be broken down into peptides. Those peptides are going to be broken down subsequently into the amino acids. The amino acids are going to be converted, uh, for example, by conversion reactions in which you can remove the amine group, forming a, um, an ammonium ion and acetate or pyruvate, and those can then be used in energy harvesting. The lipids are going to be broken down in fatty acids and glycerol, and those are going to be broken later by um, the cell into acetyl-CoA, which goes into the TCA cycle as well. The purines and pyrimidines are going to be the monomers from the nucleic acids. Those will be broken down into uric acid or dihydrouric acid and the pentoses, and those can also be eventually converted into acetate to go and provide energy. And of course, polysaccharides broken down into sugars. The sugars can eventually be broken down, for example, by glycolysis into pyruvate, and pyruvate eventually, it will be decarboxylated into acetate, acetyl-CoA, and that enters a silicatic cycle. So therefore, the cell is able to obtain carbon and energy from the hydrolytic degradation of the polymers that it encounters in its environment once it has released the enzymes. So when we look at the organic compound cycle, we're going to realize that photosynthesis is going to be generating organic matter that eventually is going to be oxidized to CO2. And that can happen either under oxid conditions or anoxic conditions. So oxygenic photosynthesis is going to generate sugars in the presence of oxygen, which are going to be respired by microorganisms, shown over here by the oxidations in the yellow arrows. And that CO2 can then be brought back into the biological system by either oxygenic photosynthesis in the presence uh, of light or anoxygenic photosynthesis in the axis of oxygen. Eventually, those compounds can then be broken down by oxidation back to carbon dioxide. Oftentimes, especially under anoxic conditions, those organic compounds are going to be broken down into methane by methanogenesis, especially after they are the product of fermentation. Methanotropy is going to be the process in which methane will then be converted back to carbon dioxide, which can then again be reduced to more sugars by photosynthesis. So in this image, what I'm showing you here are the carbon and nitrogen cycles and how those nutritional cycles are usually coupled, where the changes in one affect the other. In the middle, with the blue arrow, we have carbon dioxide being converted into organic carbon to primary production, which refers to the rate in which the carbon fixation happens during photosynthesis. The rate of primary production is usually controlled by the magnitude of the photosynthetic biomass, how many organisms, including plants, are going to be uh, photosynthesizing it, and how much availability of nitrogen there is present. So for example, if you have high amounts of organic carbon, that is going to uh, integrate high amounts of nitrogen fixation, which then is going to feed back and bring in nitrogen, which is needed for the primary production of organic carbon. But if you have low amounts of organic carbon, that is going to then decrease the amount of primary production. The same thing can happen when you have ammonia. In the presence of ammonia, 
ammonia is going to um, increase nitrification, which is going to produce nitrate. Nitrates could then be, uh, the high amount of nitrates are going to help bring primary production by organisms and plants that can use nitrate directly in during the photosynthetic process to produce organic carbon. But the problem also comes that great amounts of nitrate can then induce denitrification, which is going to now bring nitrogen gas. And that is going to reduce the amount of nitrate available um, for primary production, and that is going to decrease the process. So as you can see from this image, the nitrogen cycle as well as the uh, fixation of carbon by primary production are very interrelated. The whole amount of cellular metabolism is going to be the combination of catabolism plus anabolism and the maintenance of reactions. Molecules are going to be brought inside the cell and catabolic reactions are going to break it for energy. Waste products are going to exit the cell and that energy will be used now for the anabolic reactions which are going to generate the macromolecules and components that the cell is going to need. So all the products of the combination of catabolism and anabolism are going to be considered metabolism. So now let's take a look about how um, microorganisms are able to assimilate broken matter. And in this case, we're going to look at microbes growing in decaying wood. So wood has a lot of complex polymers. We're going to look at lipids, plant wax and oils, the plant cell wall components. There are going to be also microbial cell walls in there, including peptidoglycan. You may also find other components like animal bone, cartilage, and connective tissues. As we described earlier, the microorganisms are going to break down those components, make it into monomers, and those monomers are going to be brought inside. But once they are brought inside the cell, they are going to be converted by what is called converter enzymes, which are going to in include new um, modifications to the molecules. And some of those are going to include decarboxylation, dehydrogenation, deamination, dechlorination, and ring activation. For example, here is an example of deamination, where you have glycine that will be deaminated to generate acetate and ammonia, or alanine that will be deaminated to generate pyruvate and ammonia. The ammonia will be probably released and then can now fuel some of the nitrogen cycle that we discussed, and the acetate and pyruvate can now be used um, for energy generation or for the anabolic reactions. Dehydrogenation, it's an example in which a proton is being removed. So in this case, for example, we have lactate, and lactate, it's going to, by dehydrogenation, will produce um, pyruvate plus an NADH and a proton, shown over here. And the enzyme, the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase will mediate this reaction. So what you're going to see is that converter enzymes are going to be able to further modify the monomers in order for uh, useful intermediates to be used during anabolic or catabolic reactions. So not every microbe is able to break down a particular polymer. Some of them specialize in the type of molecule that we can bring. So microorganisms are able to break down cellulose, other ones chitin, other ones better at proteins or purines. And the genetic or blueprint of those organisms is going to dictate what is going to be the food choice that they use. And we can use that to classify the organisms as we have discussed before. So for example, look at the specificity of some of these enzymes. You have some sugars which are going to be linked in polymers by alpha 1 to 4 or alpha 1 to 6 or beta 1 to 4 or beta 4 to 6 uh, glycosidic bonds. So the repeats are going to be specific. Some of them are going to be glucose monomers. Other ones are going to be glucose and galactose or maltose and maltose monomers. So the capacity of the enzyme can cut now in the, the polymer, either in the exoposition or the endoposition. That's one we're going we're to take a moment to discuss that further. So some hydrolases are able to break and separate the monomers 
from the exo position, which basically means either from the end, the beginning or the end of the molecule. So each monomer will be cut sequentially from the end of the molecule to generate um, a shorter and shorter polymer. The end of molecules are able to attack and hydrolyze the bonds in between the molecule. Some of them are specific, so the, for example, this one cuts over here after a certain position. The ones in the bottom over here cuts after every other position. It depends also on the enzyme. So when you're looking, for example, at a hydrolytic attack on a protein, uh, are you talking about an amide bond? Or if the certain amino acid sequence is going to be recognized, for example, the protein cut after a lysine or between arginine residues. And is it happened from the N terminus or from the C terminus? So we're looking that the protein may start, the protease may cut anywhere in the middle, so be an endoprotease, or if it's going to be an exoprotease cutting from the beginning of the amine terminals or from the end from the carboxyl terminus. So here's your protein, N indicates the amino terminus, C indicates the carboxyl terminus, and this um, hydrolytic attack is happening either on the endoterms or happening um, in the exo position, excuse me, or the endo position. Here is now one of the endo ones cutting from all the beginning or this one cutting from the end. Phospholipids are also are going to be broken down or any kind of triglycerides and you're going to have phospholipases that are going to recognize those bonds. So for example, Phospholipase A1 and A2 are able to remove the fatty acid chains from the glycerol molecule, and therefore those fatty acids could be used later by beta oxidation. Phospholipase C is able to cleave in between the glycerol and the phosphate, and phospholipase D in this case is able to cut after the phosphate and separate the serine portion. So the sequential degradation of a phospholipid can generate glycerol fatty acids, a phosphate, as well as a serine amino acid. Now, fatty acids are going to be oxidized by beta oxidation. And the process of beta oxidation involves the removal of a two carbon acetyl-CoA molecule from the polymer, generating a polymer that is now two carbons shorter. And this process can be um, repeat it until the entire fatty acid is going to be consumed. So uh, 20 carbon fatty acid is able to generate 10 acetyl coase So be familiar, for example, with the um, reactions that are happening in beta oxidation because other biological processes that are going to involve hydrocarbons are going to also take advantage of this. For example, Let's look at oil bioremediation uh, using hydrocarbon oxidizing bacteria. The image over here is showing an oil spill. The oil has come out from some kind of source, it could be a petroleum tower or a ship that was carrying it. And when you look at that, you have a separation of the oil from water. The oil contains a lot of alkanes, which are going to be hydrocarbons, and those hydrocarbons are polymers of hydrogen and carbon. Some of them could be small, and those are usually released as natural gas, as shown over here in the image. Other ones are going to include crude oil hydrocarbons that could either be linear, like this uh, hydrocarbon over here, or could be aromatic, like the one shown here in the circle. The heavier ones are going to be polymers that are going to be very large, like the one in asphalt, which it contains more than 35 carbons. So you can have pentanes with five carbons, octanes with um, eight carbons, hexadecanes with 16 carbons, and other ones which are much greater. Microorganisms that are able to use hydrocarbons and oxidize them for energy don't go inside the oil drops. They actually, for example, can surround them and as shown here in this image, and we're surrounding, when they're surrounding the oil droplet, they're able to hydrolyze those uh, hydrocarbons, oxidize them in the presence of oxygen using enzymes called oxygenases. So here's an example of what is happening during hydrocarbon oxidation, and we're going to have octane as an example. 
So you're going to have the presence of an enzyme called monooxygenase, which is an enzyme that is able to bring oxygens to the hydrocarbons that doesn't have any. For example, octane over here plus NADH plus oxygen mediated by the enzyme monooxygenase, which is able to bring only one oxygen present, are, it's going to produce octanol. So that is going to go from a hydrocarbon to an alcohol. Now you have an oxygen molecule inside. You generate also NAD plus as well as water. Now you're going to have the dehydrogenation reaction that is going to happen over here. And an NADH is going to be produced. And from this alcohol, you're going to produce an aldehyde, octanal. This aldehyde, it's further going to be dehydrogenated and produce now an acid, and that's octanoid acid. This acid will be oxidized completely by beta oxidation, just in the same way that a fatty acid is oxidized. And therefore, from this eight carbon hydrocarbon, now it's gonna generate four acetyl-CoAs that could now go into the Krebs cycle. You have another mechanism by now in which aromatic um, hydrocarbons can be broken down, and this is called a ring activation. Ring activation happens by oxygenases as well. And in this image, what you have are the example of the two types of oxygenase. The monooxygenase, which I mentioned earlier, are going to add one oxygen atom, and the dioxygenases, which are able to add two hydrogen atoms. So for example, benzene, it's going to be the substrate of benzene monooxygenase, where one atom is going to be added to create benzene epoxide. Then later, that basing epoxide is going to be broken down to benzenediol, which is now the alcohol, and eventually that's going to generate a catechol intermediate. As you see, there is production of NADH from this process. Now, a different enzyme called a dioxygenase, which is able to now add two atoms of oxygen, can come into play and take that catechol intermediate and oxygenize it to break it down into cis-cis muconate. Now, as you can see, the aromatic molecule has been completely linearized, and therefore it has a carboxyl group in each side, and in that case it could be in the, uh, oxidized by beta oxidation. Other dioxygenases work in sequence. So for example, the toluene dioxygenase is able to take toluene and eventually bring it down to um, a molecule that is completely uh, linearized by a catechol intermediate. In this case, it's going to be the methyl catechol. So the linearization of those aromatic molecules now allows the cell to use beta oxidation to get harness the energy from that aromatic molecule. So this kind of reactions can be also be used to break down xenobiotic aromatic hydrocarbons. And in this image, you have some example of some of these xenobiotic aromatic hydrocarbons, including DDT, uh, the pesticide. As you can see, a lot of them are chlorinated. So them, some of them contains like malathion, contains phosphate sulfur intermediate. So this is an organophosphate. You also have other ones like atrazine, which we talked about in Bio 110, as a uh, herbicide. And as you see, it's a chlorinated molecule. So oftentimes what happens is that in order for these molecules to be degraded, you need to be having further modifications. And dechlorination is going to be one of them. They have to remove the chlorine atoms from these rings. But not all microorganisms have the capacity to be able to do that. So oftentimes these hydrocarbons remain as pollutants in soil and water for very long periods. Now, they can be eventually co-metabolized, meaning that a microorganism can be able to degrade them slowly if it has an organic material that is present that can use as an energy source. And as you can imagine, being aromatic, some of them are going to also use the monooxygenase and dioxygenase enzymes that are present in the um, organism's reservoir to be broken down. So trying one active uh, area of microbiology, it's the generation of strains of bacteria that can utilize these xenobiotic molecules as carbon and energy source. So now we know 
that the carbon flow happens from a complex macromolecule that is going to be broken into its monomers. Those monomers eventually, by converting enzymes, are going to be converted into pyruvate or acetate, and then through fermentative or, react or respiratory reactions, those pyruvate and acetate are going to be completely oxidized into carbon dioxide or, for example, an intermediate fermentative product. Now what we're going to do is, again, in the complex macromolecule breaking downs, you have hydrolysis, and those hydrolysis are not going to generate any energy. You're going to take those monomers inside the cell, and that may require some input of energy, and you can have now the converting enzymes that are going to bring it down to pyruvate and acetate, and that may give you some energy, but not always. Eventually, the conversion is going to now, through fermentation or respiration, you're going to harvest the energy of those molecules. And then the byproducts that are generated, the CO2 or the fermentative products, are going to be excreted without any energy gain. So depending on the amount of carbon to carbon or carbon to oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen are present that you have and you need to oxidize, you will have a lot of different energy harvested. So those covalent, the energy of those molecules, it's saved in the covalent bonds that are keeping it together. So you can see an alkane uh, bond for doing a carbon has a delta G naught of minus 90 versus an alkene has a lot higher energy of minus 145. So all that energy in the macromolecule is kept together in those bonds. So the capacity of the organism to break them down releases that energy. So now, the larger the compound, the more energy it contains, because you have the more number of bonds between carbons. So the oxidation state of that molecule also is going to affect the energy consumption. If a molecule is completely reduced, it has the most usable energy. Think glucose, for example. If the molecule is partially oxidized, it has some usable energy. So if you take glucose and you break them down into pyruvate, to glycolysis, pyruvate still has some usable energy. Now, if the molecule is fully oxidized to carbon dioxide, that, now mo that molecule now has no biologically usable energy. So the greater the level of oxidation the molecule has, the more energy it has. And this is what is going to be shown here in this image. And what we're going to be looking at is what is called the cell growth yield. So this image is looking at the cell yield measured in grams of cells per mole of substrate use, and the amount of free energy available as delta G naught by the molecules that are present. So for example, iron, hydrogen, ammonia, and this other one over here, which I cannot see, I cannot think about what it is right now. These are going to be chemolithotrophic substrates, and the bacteria that are able to break and utilize those molecules are going to have a low cell yield because of the low amount of energy present on it. But now when we start to look at chemoorganotrophic substances like lactate, succinate, glucose, and hexadecane, like the hydrocarbons that I show you in oil, you now increase the amount of cell yield because you have a lot more carbon to carbon bonds present in the molecule. So look at the amount of energy that can be generated and the amount of cell yield that it's present when you have a greater molecule with greater number of carbons. So let's look at the cell growth yield, which is used, uh, expressed as Ys. So cell growth yield, it's the amount of cell made per unit of substrate use. And it's usually expressed as the grams of bacteria as you show you in the previous graph, per mole of substrate. So for example, in E. coli, you will get a cell growth yield of 25 gram of bacteria per mole of E. coli growing anoxygenically on glucose. So Ys is going to vary according to certain things. Number one is going to be strain dependent. So it's going to depend on the biochemical pathway that is available to the microorganism to be able to break down that organic molecule. And those different pathways usually yield different amount of ATP. So 
we think of Ys as the relative efficiency of the microorganism to harvest energy in the form of ATP. So how efficient is the organism to get energy is considered Ys. Now, you can also have Y-ATP, which is the amount of cells that are generating per mole of ATP. And that gives you a different measure. That is the measure of the biosynthetic efficiency of the organism. How good is that organism as using ATP for its necessities and growth? And usually, across the board, Y-ATP tends to be about 10 grams of dry weight per mole of ATP that is present. So most microorganisms are equally efficient at using ATP. They're not equally efficient at gaining ATP from a substrate molecule. So why ATP is nearly constant in all strains? Because most of them are using similar biosynthetic pathways to get their energy. And they do it with similar level of efficiency. So this table over here is comparing the YS and the YATP for three different microorganisms, Lactobacillus delbrucae, Enterococcus fecalis, and Zymomonas mobilities. So when you look at the mole of ATP per glucose that Lactobacillus generates, it gets two moles of ATP, so using glycolysis. Enterococcus fecalis also use glycolysis and therefore gives you two moles of ATP per glucose molecule. But Salmonas mobilis is using a different uh, mechanism. It's using the Etner-Dudorov pathway that only generates one mole of ATP per mole of glucose. So now, when you look at the YS, which is here is shown in this table by Ymax, the grams of cells per mole, lactobacillus, it's going to generate 21 grams of cells per mole of glucose and Ectrococcus fecalis is also going to have 20 grams of cell per mole of glucose, but not Salmonella mobilis. It's only going to have 9 grams of cells per mole of glucose. Now, how efficient are these microorganisms at using ATP? It's shown here in the Y ATP to the right. Lactobacillus, it's 10.5 grams of cells per mole of ATP. Ectrococcus fecalis, 10 grams of cells per mole of ATP. And Salmonella mobilis, it's 9 grams of cells per mole of ATP. So the Y-ATP stays constant within a range of 10 versus the Y-S varies according to their metabolic capacity. So remember, if you have a chemical energy available to a bacteria in an organic molecule, there is going to be a microorganism that evolves a way to degrade that molecule. And with that, I'm going to stop the lecture. Thank you very much, and I'll see you on Thursday.